Welcome. Thanks. Uh, first of all, Kelly, thank you so much for doing this. Um, on behalf of the large crowd we've drawn today, um, I, we're all really grateful to have you here. Thanks. I think I should confess it's all the <laughs> is not in the movie, just in the trailer. <laughs> if that's why you're going to the movie. I don't How many people have already seen Night Moves? <laughs> Okay. See, we're talking about a movie that's not even Okay, yet. so we're going to speak carefully about Let's the film. Let's talk about the end. <laughs> <laughs> we, already had a, we already had a whole pre-conversation about trailers and clips, and so we are going to show a couple of clips, but we've carefully chosen them so that, as not to reveal too much. Um, maybe, um, I, don't want to tr I don't want to describe the film. Uh, how do you describe the film? You said that you know, we should make decisions about movies based on just a little bit of information and... I try not to. Um, well, it's funny when you're making a film, especially a film like this, which is to me a film of sort of a lot of little reveals. Um, you're being so careful about that for so long, and then um, and then you go just you know tell it all. <laughs> but anyway. Um, uh, what's my um, my nutshell for the film? Um, it's uh, gee, you could probably do that better than me. I just didn't want to give away too much. That's why I thought maybe if, you, if there, there's a way that you like, how yeah. do you, what are the what do you? What do I say? I haven't been asked yet, but I um, we uh, three uh, people come together uh, and sort of gain a little strength in numbers, and they. Uh, go out and um, their goal is to take down this hydraulic dam more as a symbol of their um, fury than, or frustration than is um, not as really a means to that. Well, I guess the idea is that it will call attention to itself and it'll make a statement. And, um, and then the film has other people around. There's different, um, there's a lot of different groups doing different, going about things in different ways, and I guess ultimately um, we're just sort of looking at the questions of uh, are any of the things that any of the people are doing the right things or enough or, um, or and if they're the wrong things, what, what should any, any of us be doing um, if we're all about to go over the cliff, um, basically. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of. So what, uh, let's start with the sort of simple, kind of straightforward question, but what interested you in this particular story at this moment? Uh, tell us about when you first made the decision to embark on this project and why. Uh, like a, quite a few of the films uh, I've done out in Oregon, um, with uh, my co-writer, John Raymond. It started with an idea of a particular place. And uh, he and his partner were friends with these organic farmers down in Southern Oregon. And uh, John became kind of curious about the kind of pol politics that flowed through the, um, through the community down there. And so I started going down to check it out and um, and so we sort of, uh, we knew we wanted to shoot on this farm. And, uh, and I'm always really interested in process and showing the process of things um, and how things get done. So uh, uh, we sort of laid out this plan and um, set it in this sort of heist genre. Um, I wanted to ask you about process, so I'm glad you, you said that word. Um, can you talk about process, and is your process from film to film consistent? Is it the writing process mm -hmm. that then blends into the filmmaking process, or maybe help us understand yeah. how you make movies and why you work sure. in the way that you do? Um, well, it's always a little, it's always a little bit different, but um, uh, whether we're starting with a seed of an idea or a, um, or a, some of the films have come from short stories, in uh, which case I'm adapting those into the screenplay. And sometimes uh, we, uh, John and I, have been writing the screenplays together. Or he's, I mean, he's he's a writer, and um, which is to me is a little different than being a screenplay writer, uh, in that he really deals with the blank page and. Um, which to me is one of the hardest things that uh, in the whole process. 
Um, and then I uh, start scouting pretty early on, and I spend a lot of time driving around the country and looking, uh, even though I've often ended up shooting in the places that we first had in mind for the scripts, all, you know, with old joy, I went to hot springs all over the country, or with Wendy and Lucy, I went to uh, less fun, went to Walgreens and Safeways all over the country until I sort of just wear myself down. And um, and uh, and so the big scouting, and, and just scouting just brings a lot of information, information that you wouldn't even necessarily, not even necessarily the information you're looking for. It's just um, the big scout on this, like the big search was for a dam that would let us shoot there. And so I went to many, many dams, but um, yeah, one, I, uh, you know, I met, when I was scouting a place, you know, for someone's house, uh, I ended up meeting a guy who, um, who was talking to me and I noticed he was missing a couple of fingers and he asked me what the film was about in, in really shortcut language, I probably, on a better day, if I wasn't tired or whatever, I wouldn't really use this terminology, but I said, oh, it's about these eco-terrorists. And he was like, oh, I'm really into eco-terrorism. I love <laughs> blowing stuff up. He's like, I blow up trees, I blow up this. And I was like, well, that's not exactly what I meant. But anyway, that guy ended up like teaching me how to build a bomb. <laughs> and, um, and he was sort of explaining to me with his you know, it's hit and miss, it's hit and miss. And I was like, oh, I see. Um, but you know, like I, I didn't go looking for that information for him. And, and I always think that um, scouting just ends up bringing so much weird information back. Um, so that's always a super, super long process. And, um, and uh, that's my, I, I teach film at Bard College and my big uh, things with my students, a battle I'll never win is um, you know, that Google isn't research, that you have to ha like, have an experience when you do research, and um, because you'll fall into things that you aren't the particular things you, you just don't know what will come on the bus ride to the library. But anyway, um, and then they're like, get an iPad, <laughs> like, shut up. <laughs> but yeah, so that scouting's a big part of the process. I'd love to go into that a little bit more um, because um, I find it fascinating to think about and the idea of you challenging your filming your film students to think about research being not only about finding the information, but about placing yourself in in a location. Not just finding the location, but being in the location and finding the guy who you never would have expected, you know, who could teach you how to build a bomb. Um, is that aspect of your filmmaking something that has evolved for you, or was it always a part of your storytelling approach or process, or? I, yeah, I don't, I spend a lot of time driving around the country, and I'm tired now, and I don't want to anymore, but I, um, for some reason, um, well, I teach in New York, and I've been making these films out west, and whatever, it's a silly thing. I have the dog, the dog from Wendy and Lucy. She doesn't fly, so I drive back and forth a lot because I have the dog. But, um, but, this, but I've been um, doing that since I was a kid. My family, uh, we lived in Miami and we used to go up to Montana, camping to Montana in the summers. And in college I used to do, you know, uh, you know, I would just do drive away cars for three months where you, whatever, you took the car to wherever the car was going and then you waited there. Like, I'll take a car to Texas, and you wait there until you find a car, and then, like, we have a car going to, that needs to go to San Francisco, and you just spend the summer. So, I don't know, I've been doing it for a really long time, and um, I, I don't know, now I'm, you know, whatever. I, I have all these things that I think about that I never used to think about. Just, I would just get into some broken down car and drive, and now I, you know, I check the tornadoes, I check that, like, I'm so, it's, I'm so not the romantic roadster anymore. The more I do it, the more, do they have Lyme disease there? <laughs> Are there tornadoes? I mean, I'm really, um, I talk to Justine Curlin a lot, the photographer who spends a lot of, she, we're often on the road at the same time, and she's so hardcore in her van with her, whatever, pistol under her pillow, and I'm like, oh, 
I'm going to the best Western, but um, <laughs> but anyway, but I but it does end up um, seeming important ultimately to uh, I don't know thinking and just getting away from your mail and um, I don't know how why it's um, I don't know how to get out of it, but it's just part of it. So yeah. That sounds like you <laughs> describe it as a bit of a trap in a certain way, but yet it a comfortable is a trap. one. Yeah, but. Yeah, but yeah, it's part of it for some reason. It seems to be um, necessary. I mean, yeah. So that part of the process for this particular film, how many, how much time is that? Um, I scouted over a year. I mean, off and on, I went through th three scouts. Um, I mean, it's a lot of scouting. We scouted, you know, uh, a couple dozen dams that were all over the state. And when we finally found a dam that, um, which was a, really a great producing feat and I I would like to say that about all these films that really um, the producers that they are able to make these films happen and figure out how they could happen and how we could all where we could live and how we could live they they're um, so unsung but um, the uh, Neil Coppin and Nisha Johnny the they're the, it's amazing that these films get made for the the little what we have to go on, um, so. And you've worked with them more than once now. Yeah, we we've done f four, the last four films together. Yeah. And so, tell us about the <coughs> excuse me the conversation you have with Neil Neil and Anish. Um, you've worked with them before, so they know how to work with you or what you're trying to accomplish. But in in the case of this particular film, um, you're just laying out for them what. Okay, you're going to find a dam, and well, we're going to need. No, well, Neil actually. Uh, the, like the slightest door was open a little bit to one dam and he sort of created a relationship with the guy in charge of the dam over the course of a year <laughs> and um and you know built enough trust with him that we were allowed to go there and they got really into it they were um uh you know, they were like, oh, if you were going to blow up this dam, how you'd really do it is you'd put, you know, you put the boat, this, you're like, wow, you guys have really thought about this, which is interesting. <laughs> yeah, you spend a lot of time at the dam, I guess you think about uh, how to blow it up. But, um, yeah, the, um, so a lot, of, some of the scouting took place in boats in this film, and uh, the actual place where we shot was this uh, reservoir, which is, used to be a forest, and, uh, now uh, it's a place where people ski and um, and fish. And the guy who uh, was take took me out on the water the first time. He told me he, he grew up there, and he and he's like, yeah, this was all forest. We hunt. I spent my whole life hunting in this forest, and we're like on a boat. And um, and he's like, and then you know, then they built the dam, and it you know it, it became a reservoir and. Uh, and I was like, wow, you know, you must, aren't you, you must be so mad about that. And he's like, no, I really like fishing. Fishing's good. And he just like, wow, like he just accepted that where he grew up is now underwater and sort of changed his sport. And um, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you, you know, you arrive at a place all sort of like, look what they've done to this place I've never been to before. And the guy that grew up there is like, yeah, I like fishing. <laughs> so. You know, it's, um, oh, you meet just a lot of interesting people, I, yeah. Well, these are some of the kernels of conversation that start the film, um, and I'm notifying my colleagues listening in in the booth that we're about to show a clip. Okay. Uh, we're only going to show two. We don't want to give away too much today. Um, only two. Two more than maybe some might want to show, but... But this one's early in the film, and, and there's a conversation about the plan. You've, you've set up a little bit about their, their intention, which is to bring down this dam. So in this first clip, uh, let's take a look at uh, clip B from my colleagues upstairs, and then we'll talk about it. We don't need to see any more of that we, movie. We don't have to watch the other <laughs> clip. We don't have to. Um, how many people here uh, w watch clips or trailers before deciding whether to see a movie? I'm just curious. 
How many people absolutely are against it and don't like to see trailers or clips before they go into a movie? <laughs> Raise your hands high. I want to see. No, be honest. If you, okay. We had a whole conversation about this earlier. So let's talk about um, the broader location, the bigger location for a number of these movies, a number of your movies, and you talked about the Northwest. Um, why is the Northwest important to you? Why has it become um, a recurring character, I guess? Is that a fair way to put it? I don't know. Um, I'm done with that state. No, um, it's, I am, but, um, but it's been good to me. I, um, it's such a diverse state. It has you know, like an old growth forest, an ocean, a desert. Um, it's, um, you can do a lot there. I've done a lot there, um, but uh, I should probably do something else. Um, you know, largely it has to do with the stories. Uh, you know, I've been, I was working with a writer who uh, likes to be at home and write about <laughs> what's out his window. And, um, and my producer, Neil Copps, out there, and we, um, it's just, I like to, it doesn't have to be Oregon anymore. Um, it's, you know, the, the Western came about when um, I was scouting for Wendy and Lucy. I drove through that desert and I really wanted to do something there. John and I both did. And um, so it's just sort of the one thing is kind of uh, gone into the next. But uh, I like just, I like going um, away where it's not, where it's hard to get to and um, in a dream world, but this is getting harder and harder where there's no cell phone. Like in Meeks, we did, there was no, nobody could even look at their phone. That was awesome. Um, uh, just, I like going away and feeling like we're off and there's no, and the actors are so free because no one's looking at them. They're, so they can just be free and, and no, I just like going off and forgetting about every, just, like with a group, you're on an adventure with a group of people, and we a lot of the same people worked on all the films, so um, it's 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 great. Everyone get you get really tight, and you feel like you're in on something together, and um, <coughs> everything that's super super hard about it is mixed up with everything that's really great and beautiful about it too. And um, it's I like the um, I like, and so Oregon offers a lot of places you can just go and just be really out of the way, um, so. Is it difficult maintaining that lifestyle of teaching in New York, filming there, driving around in between? I mean, it, or you've ha you just figured out a way to juggle all of those different, no. you haven't? It's, no, no, it's a constant, um, I, I mean, this is probably what the movies are. I always have the feeling that I'm in the, wrong place of where I'm supposed to be. I'm, no, I'm always, blah, no, I haven't figured it all out. I really um, love BART, I like uh, teaching at BART. I really work with some interesting filmmakers there. Um, I don't know, people know, uh, Peter Hutton teaches there and Jackie Goss and Peggy Awish and Ben Coonley, filmmakers I really like and um, I'm, really happy to be colleagues with. I think it's a special place. Um, and I would probably live out west if I didn't teach, you know. I mean, so, no, it's it's like a, I mean, but I've been in New York for 25 years. It's hard here, right? I mean, you know. <laughs> but then you have like a Fassbender festival across the street, so, you know. Um, no, I haven't like figured it out. You seem like you have. No, I haven't. To uh, probably a lot of us, it's like, oh, okay, she goes and makes her movie, she teaches here. Like, it just seems yeah. like it seems like there's a balance. Seems like it all makes sense, but it's interesting to hear. That. If I had money, it would make sense. If right. I, I mean, like, you know, if I was like going to my house in Oregon and then going to my house in New York, that <laughs> it's just like I'm like, or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's just I'm not haven't figured it out. I'm I feel like I'm I'm still 20 and I'm just always trying to figure out how to live. And it's funny when you teach in college, people think like when they graduate, that's like, oh, next year I can make the big decision. And you're just like, I hate to break it to them that you have to like <laughs> keep figuring it out forever. <laughs> that's for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask you about teaching a little bit because I'm just curious. 
Um, you're teaching at Bard. You've taught at NYU. Um, what do you teach? Uh, what What are the courses that you teach? And, and tell us about them. I'm just curious. Um, uh, well, it... At NYU, you get handed a syllabus that everybody's been teaching since Marty went to school there for 30 years. I mean, it's like the same syllabus, so. Um, but uh, uh, I, I, different semesters, different things. I teach sound design and basically visual storytelling and um, just try to, trying to uh, keep alive the, uh, <laughs> the idea of setting a camera on something stable and not holding it in the palm of your hand. But, um, <laughs> another lost battle, um, but um, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, mostly that, just uh, how to get something across through montage and editing and uh, blocking and camera placement without uh, trying, you know, to not rely on dialogue, basically, but. Is it a, is it a battle to convey some of that um, that knowledge? Are people receptive to it? Or is it, uh, how, how are you finding um, yeah. that? Yeah, no, it Bard, there's a good environment. They take a landscape <coughs> class with Peter Hutton. I mean, it's it's the environment's right for it there, I think. Um, I mean, people are shocked about narrative filmmaking, about what it is, you know, students. I taught a beginning class this semester, and I gave them a scene they had to redo all semester long. and. Uh, it was funny, the first week, kids coming in like, I couldn't find a room where there was a bed across from a mirror. <laughs> They're just like, yes. I, <laughs> like the whole idea of like, wait, am I gonna just be wrangling actors and moving furniture all semester? Like, yeah, you know, just the um, how unromantic it all really is is always um, fun and surprising to everybody. But um, no, people, there's, those students are pretty open, I think. Yeah, they're by and large. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I want to talk about sound design, and I didn't realize you taught a class in sound design. Um, perhaps um, one way to ask the question would be just to kind of ask you to speak to the importance of sound design to you, and or maybe maybe a different way to ask it would be just to tell us how you teach it. Like, how do you explore sound design, generally speaking? Um, and how do you introduce um, some of the I'm, ideas? I'm still always learning how to teach, so I, I, I wouldn't like say I have some method. I, I, um, I, I don't, I'm always, I mean, we sit in a dark room a lot and just listen to things, so there's a lot of listening. But um, I don't know, sound design to me, I actually, st Larry Fezenden, the filmmaker Larry Fezenden, he was the actor in River of Grass, my first film, and he was also the editor and uh, I got to spend a summer with him. We, we cut that movie, we shot it on 16 millimeter and we cut it on three quarter inch offline uh, video without time code and then matched it by eye to cut the negative. So, um, but um, in that, uh, I really, he really, uh, that's when I really started thinking about sound design. He really, um, just the idea of just considering sound with every, with every cut and with every image and just the possibilities of what it could be. Uh, that, was, that was one of the main things I got from making that film and spending time in an editing room with him. Um, and so, I don't know, it's always early on in the design of what the sound uh, s sort of strategy will be. Mm. And, um, and yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, when you get stuck with picture, you can p turn to sound for a while. And um, I don't know, I, it gets written about how quiet my films are, but I do so much sound work, I'm always like, are you really listening? <laughs> 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 it's not, there's, did you hear that mosquito? Um, but um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I don't know. Speaking of sound, yes. <laughs> um, I like that you said, did you hear that mosquito? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Was there, you placed it there. People there don't. Are, in Meeks, there are tracks and tracks of flies that were recorded on um, location and placed very carefully. And then everyone wrote about how there's nothing in the sound design. Ah. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> 
I have to look at my clock to see how we're doing on time um, because I want to make sure we leave time for some questions. So if you are going to have a question, um, we have a couple of microphones that are going to go around. Why don't we take a couple now? And I want because I want to get a sense of where. Uh, how many people here are film students right now? Um, I wanted to get a sense. So how many people here are filmmakers or writers? Okay, I just wanted to get a sense of the audience because that'll help us uh, get a sense of what we should, where we should emphasize. But uh, let me see what you're interested in, and I'll probably throw in a couple more questions in a minute. Um, raise your hand if you have a question, and let's start up in the uh, back row there. Yes, hi. Hi. Um, I, I had the good fortune to see the film. I loved it. I've loved all your films. This is terrific. Um, it's a huge change, though, in the acting. These are much more prominent. Not that Michelle Williams is not now a prominent that, actress, but Michelle, a chopped liver. Yeah, yeah, no, but but in Wendy and Lucy, she was really kind not of just not even start to mention Lucy. What is she? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lucy the dog. Yeah. But seriously, th this is this is um, a real powerhouse trio of actors, and I'm interested how you selected them and how you worked with them. And really, it's just about Dakota Fanning's first adult role. She's really not a kid at all in this film, which is a change for her. So can you talk about the, the composition of the acting without saying what it is they actually do? Um, uh, yeah, Dakota Fanning plays this character, Dina, who's like sort of maybe an Oberlin college dropout, gone west and gotten radicalized. Um, not that any of that gets told to you in the movie, but um, and uh, Jesse plays um, sort of a fundamentalist uh, on the left, and uh, Sarsgaard is like a creep the way he always is, um, <laughs> <laughs> on some level. But um, they, it, I mean, casting is such a such a long long process. Um, it's a really long process. I mean, the idea that like so many things have to come together for. Uh, uh, for everything to work. I I love Dakota and I I thought she might be too young for the part and um, and then I finally spoke to her and she explained to me that she was not too young and that it was her role and I was like, "Whoa. Okay. Um and she reminded me a lot. I was like, "Oh, it's just like Dina." Okay. Uh, no, she convinced me. I I never thought of it again after um and so I mean, for these films I especially learned this uh, when I took people out into the middle of the desert in Meek's Cutoff. There's, uh, we don't have like the usual separation of like cast and crew, um, where there's like some comfortable living for the cast. And I mean, it's a really pretty equal playing field. Like the craft service person has the same sort of setup that Dakota has. You know, it's all pretty even. And because we just don't have, any perks, and we don't have really money to keep people like, oh, you could be over in a trailer, and you know, we'll call you when we need you, or we'll shuttle you back, and we're shooting in remote places, so everybody has to come to set. Um, so, and then while you're there, no use you just sitting around, can't you pick up that box, and or Jesse, you know, drive that truck even when you're off camera, or whatever it is, they, they're really involved. And some actors find that really like a, to be a new experience. I mean, Dakota said she had never been on a film like that before, and um, and they get really into it, and everybody gets really close, and you know, so they're out in the freezing rain with us, um, and or some actors aren't into it, and then it's a, like you're either really into it or you're really not into it, and you're like, what did I get myself into? So. It's like not just finding the people that are right for the part, it's like trying to anticipate like who can really, who's gonna really be up for what we're gonna put them through. And, um, and these guys were really up for it and it made the ride so great. I mean, they were just so down in it with us. Um, and then Dakota left a week before the shooting ended as she was scheduled to and it was a big, heartache for her to leave and we, it was sad for us for her to leave and I remember we were out in some muddy messy night and I got a 
text from her, and she was on the red carpet for Twilight going, I wish I was with you guys, blah, 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 you know? So, I mean, when it works out, it's really, it's really great if you get people that are really just, um, like, going to be down in it with you. And, uh, and, they, and they all were, which was lucky for me. And, I mean, I, I worked with Jesse for, Jesse came out early and he went and lived on the farm and lived in the yurt and worked on the farm and worked with the farmers and helped them build this giant hideous um, greenhouse right in the middle of the field where I had planned all these shots. Um, <laughs> and he was so proud to show it to me. And I was like, what have you done? But, um, but it was very, shooting on a farm is just, um, had so many surprises. I went out a year early and planned all my shots and had never thought about crop rotation, and then went back, and the place was completely different, and redid my shots, and then left Jesse there, and he built this humongous airplane hangar in the middle of the field. Um, but anyway, he likes to really get, you know, he was really, um, you know, he's a man of a million questions, and analyzes everything, and Dakota's doesn't talk about her process at all. I sent her a box of research. She said she never took the tape off the box. I mean, she's just like, tell me what you want, and you know, but it's not a, she's just, she works her own way. And, and Peter, I never really met face to face until I was meeting him. He was stepping onto the boat, and we were gonna shoot in 10 minutes, and it was, you know, pouring down rain. And, um, you know, you're sort of, talking about wardrobe on like nice to meet you can you get can you uh i'm gonna cut your hair now is that okay <laughs> da, 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 da. you know it's all it's a little um so basically these are you know pe what, what ends up happening same with michelle people will give you like a, a certain amount of time and you decide what you're going to do with it and mostly i need to shoot with it so a lot, you know there's not a lot of rehearsal and time and we're just sort of in the thick of it when it as we get going it's fascinating to me that, that on the one hand, you said that each person has to be kind of up for this journey, and yet each of them come to it from such a different place yeah, and sure. a different approach. Yeah. Um, that's just fascinating to me. So the, the, the shared experience becomes what's similar, or what's common between them. But other than that, it's, they're coming at it from all different perspectives. If you shoot in Oregon, you, you're wet a lot of the time. And we shoot a lot of night stuff, so you're wet and cold a lot of the time. And they, yeah, they were somehow okay with that, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's take another question. Um, can we go um, down here in the front row? What was one of the greatest difficulties you had on the project, and how would you solve that in future projects? Well, it was the first time I was ever shooting boat to boat, and I so I thought that that would be my big hurdle. But I'm so used to shooting outside. I, I really found the hardest days of the shoot is we shoot shot inside this house, and I and just shooting with four walls. I actually, um, I really felt limited, and um, much like. Uh, you know, a scene in Wendy and Lucy, there's a Walgreens parking lot, and I spent an endless amount of time in that parking lot before we shot, and I sort of ne felt I never really conquered that space. It always just, I just, whatever, I just didn't know how to make that space work to my liking, ultimately. And, um, and this film, too, like, I gave the least, uh, it seemed like, oh, here's a, I gave, you know, we're in a place where we're finally dry and warm and we can control the light, and, but yet four walls, what? A table. Um, it just, I, those are the hardest things for me, so I, I really need to kind of conquer walls, <laughs> I think. Um, uh, you know, being that I'm not, like, I, don't, I can't move the walls where I am usually, like we shoot on location. So I, I, I think um, interiors are, hard for me because I've spent a lot of time shooting outside. Okay, let's take another question and we'll go to the gentleman in the second row. Uh, are uh, you going to tell me something I said before at another no, time? No. Okay. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I saw your film and uh, I was really impressed by the tempo of the film, particularly. Uh, you found it with sound and editing and this light yet strong like piano music that you used. Uh, how, how did you pace your film and how do you work uh, in the editing room or do, do you work with the, the editor on a quotidian basis? Um, I'm the editor, so uh, we get along fine. It's good. <laughs> What's it like? I'm <laughs> Well, actually, sometimes we don't, but, um, um, so it's, you know, um, I don't have, on the one hand, you know, it's nice after all the hubbub of making a movie to just be in a quiet place with your film by yourself again, but you also don't really have that person there to bounce stuff off of. Um, but I do, I work with, I start pretty early on working with the, uh, uh, Jeff Grace who did the score and, um, and he, that's a really long process of him sending me stuff and me trying stuff and sending it back and sort of giving him little sounds, mostly sounds that aren't necessarily musical that I want to work from. And so that, I guess, sort of helps. Um, it's really, uh, I'm a, it's trial and error. I don't, I'm, I mean, people give themselves 10 weeks to cut a film, which to me is really fast. It's actually the cheapest part of filmmaking, you know? I mean, you, it's not expensive anymore to be cut. I mean, if, I guess if you have a real editing suite, it is. <laughs> um, but if you cut on your dresser in your bedroom, it's very cheap. Um, but, um, uh, but it's a slow, I'm a, I'm a big believer in just letting my film be bad for a long time and not hurrying to find a good cut. Just like letting it be bad and whittling away at it uh, slowly. And um, the hardest part being showing people who um, I want notes from, who really I've been getting notes from the same people for probably 20 years. But they're the people I sort of probably have, you know, I really, you know, I, sh I show Todd Haynes a lot of cuts to my films. I really care what Todd thinks about my film, but I gotta show him my crappiest stuff, you know? And, um, or whoever it is. Like, um, so I do show bad cuts to get information, and I, um, I just don't hurry to get something down that will just, like, give me that sigh of relief, like, okay, it's gonna be okay. I, I try to, um, uh, I don't know, I always think of it like you dragged a big log into your living room and you're gonna like whittle it down and find your movie in there. But I don't, I don't have that much footage, so on the other hand, you know. <laughs> it's not like I have to go through the 15 takes to find the, <laughs> there's this one and there's this one. And so, you know, I mean, we don't, we don't have, um, but <clears throat> I mean, one thing that, well, no, I can't tell you that because you didn't see the movie yet. I'll but anyway, yeah, that's it, how it goes. Mm. Mm. <laughs> when you show Todd Haynes a bad cut, is it because you're, I think what you were saying a minute ago, is, is it that you're, 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 at, you're wanting him to respond to one particular piece of it? Like, do you, I guess, do you know what you're hoping to get from him or from someone else when you're showing them that bad cut, or is it? I know that certain things aren't working, and I don't Got exactly it. always know what it is that's not working, or sometimes even, like, one person will, just like in a screenplay, someone will go like, oh, I really like that thing that happens, and someone else goes, oh, I don't like that. And whether they like it or don't, you know that they're pointing to it, so you're like, for some reason, it's sticking out. What it, or, or sometimes when people don't like stuff in an edit, they don't really like what's, what's next to it more than the, it's, it's not always like right where the note is, but just that you know things aren't certainly working, and you could make it better, but maybe, I, I, it's hard to, I don't know, it's such a process of mm -hmm. just, um, just, but basically the thing of just, uh, you know, it's nice, it, I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate to have some, uh, some good sets of eyes that I can, um, or sometimes like the vaguest, like I, I, I showed Gus Van Zandt a cut of this film, and like that's pretty painful, because I'm pretty sure he'll never go see the movie finished, and so I just have to live with it. He thinks I may, made a crappy film. So, but um, but he, he gave me a really good note that was very him and kind of vague, and he just said, what you're trying to get across is really easy to get. And that was like a really good note, like, okay. Like, that's just, that was, that was really helpful, even though it sounds kind of big and broad, that was a good note, you know, so. 
Let's take a couple more questions. Um, can we go over to the side? If I missed a hand on this side, I was looking this way, sorry. We'll um, this is potentially a huge question. Um, I'll try to ask it, or a big topic. I'll try to ask it in a simple way. Um, for this film, did you shoot it on film or digital, and why did you make that choice? Um, I shot it in the Alexis. I, it was the first time I didn't shoot film. And uh, a huge amount of the film takes place at night in really big places. And I couldn't afford 35, and I couldn't light for 16. I just couldn't light the amount of space I needed to light. Thus, <laughs> I had the experience you, everyone's been telling you about of shooting digital, um, which is like a mixed bag, you know? It, it, in, it, you can shoot in low light, that's for sure. The whole idea that it's so much faster and you're so much, you know, it's so much smaller than 35 and all that, you have like a huge tech guy in a tent with you. So it's not really faster or, um, I mean, you're not reloading, but you're doing other stuff. You're doing other, um, so I didn't think it was, but you're like what you're looking at, you're almost looking at your color timed, your monitor. I mean, I always have the crappiest monitors, but like I could, the fact that I could actually see, I mean, you're almost looking at, you're looking at such a, good version of what you're shooting, um, which you're not on film. But still, I think there's, um, there are shots when it's just like, oh, the, it just rained and there's the cloud coverage and the light is just ideal. It's the perfect time of day. There is something that is not quite magical about it that by the not being on film, I think just the, not even the, f just that there's nothing. Uh, I think Chris Blavelt, my DP, did a great job in not letting it have that flatness that is the biggest problem. But uh, just that it doesn't have light going through it. I think there's, it, you know, you, um, but now you do this crazy thing where you add film grain later, which, you know, you need because everything, you don't want that flatness, but there's something that feels so pretentious about it when you're doing it, you know, it's just hard to know. And then it's a, you know, a whole rabbit hole, like how much, how big a grain, how fast should it move? It's just like a world of, um, uh, but I would like to shoot film again. Yeah. I mean, I, I, even if you end up, I mean, it's not, like 16 is a good answer to HD because you just can have some grain at the end of it all. Is there anyone on this side of the room? I'm sorry, I missed you. Where, where? Let's get the microphone back. Oh, on this side, I can't even see that. Okay, hi. Hi. Yeah, I was hidden. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about financing your films and if each one has been totally I different. I, I can't believe I pointed you out behind I the know. pole. We can't even see you. Take I'm that microphone away I'm just curious because it's been something that you've been mentioning about the, you know, the, the editing and how much, and if you are involved in it, and ha has it been different from film to film? Oh. And it can be very, you, it can be like a one-line answer. It doesn't have to be like okay. a long thing. Uh, I'm, again, I'm really fortunate to have producers who, um, they don't get in my shit and I don't get in their shit. And that's their shit to worry about. I mean, I have to worry about it in that I don't have time to do the things I want to do. So I worry about it in those terms. But um, uh, I'll just say this. The less you take, and I'm not saying that I ever took less than I could get. I have not. I always want more. But the less you take, the more uh, people leave you alone. I mean, nobody comes into the editing room. People give me notes, but there's no pressure to take them. And uh, it's a very private affair, but I'm, sh I'm sure there's a point where that wouldn't be true. I mean, I have final cut and that's a hard thing to have these days. So um, uh, I'm still, you know, me and my producers are still drive, you know, running our own cars into the ground on our productions, but, um, but I have Final Cut, so, um, and I make my living teaching. So, it, you know, it's still, it's like very, you know, it's, 
I mean, they're small films, so, you know, they're, they're, first, I don't know, I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> um, I've been very fortunate, and I assume, you know, there was, I had like 13 years between my first feature and my second feature, and, um, and I have made these last films, like, kind of right next to each other, and I always assume that it will stop again and that you know you just make them while you can and I don't know it always feels like it's a sinking ship I mean after Meeks I was like I'm never going to be allowed to make another film after this like <laughs> um uh I really thought that would be the end but um I don't know you just feel fortunate if you sort of eke one more out I guess um like you got away with something somehow and I guess again to something I said earlier, I think it, again to the to us watching your movies, it seems like you've figured out a way to do it. Like it doesn't feel like, from the observer's point of view, I don't know. Do people disagree with me? I mean, it just feels like you've found the balance, you've found the way to make movies on a certain scale, but you're in control, and that you can keep doing that. Yeah. Mind you, there's lots of men making movies that are in total control that have a lot more money. I just want to say, you know. I mean, Spike's in control, Wes Anderson's in control, Noah Baumbach's in control, Todd Haynes is in control, Gus Van Zandt's in control, Jim Jarmusch is in control, blah, 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 blah. I could go on and on. But, uh, good for them. No, <laughs> no hard feelings. No, um, <laughs> you know, on the one hand, I'm just like, who says you should be able to make any money off making movies? These are small films, so I, I you know, um, uh, but when you're driving your shitty car cross country four times a year, you get a lot of time to think and <laughs> what could be. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think there's not yet though, uh, a woman that's, um, getting to make her own films on the scale that, um, You're not supposed to talk about it. All I really want is a little section in a video store before the video stores are gone. <laughs> Women don't get that either. <laughs> That's not so much, right? Just a little section. <laughs> All right, we better wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> We're almost out of time, but was there anybody else who wants to throw in a last question? Um, can we come down to the second row? Oh, we'll do two more. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. We'll go second row and then first row. So here, and then, and then uh, right up in the uh, middle. Well, you, you talk about them, that they're small movies, but maybe I, I hear more personal. I mean, yeah. you, you're the writer, you're the director, you're the editor. Can you see yourself broadening that to include, be more inclusive of other people who, in other words, make a, big, make a bigger film that, that maybe has more participation with other people that can, that uh, can make it a bigger production? Yeah, that's like a, it's a really tough question. I mean... These films happen, you know, I'm also the editor because I can afford me, um, you know. I mm -hmm, mean, mm -hmm. there, you know, when we start, the, a lot has to be done on these films before we get financing. And, and uh, people like Larry Fessenden's company is like, they'll, he'll help me be, for, be able to go out and scout just so I can put something together to like, sort of, like I have to get it going and it has to, before anybody really comes in with money, you have to feel like, oh yeah, this train's leaving the station kind of thing. So some actors have been really kind and signed on really early and, um, but it's, um, I know, I mean, it's too hard to do what ifs because life is life and um, these, and I'm not, you know, truth be told, I'm not, huh, the, you probably can't tell, I'm not the most like flexible person that can just do anything. <laughs> so um, I, um, you know, figuring out how you can work and um, in, my, in my decade of not getting a film made, I did um, have some chance, you know, some things like almost, a lot of, almost got happened and didn't happen, but I, what I really learned is how unskilled I was at the part of filmmaking that has to do with, um, 
you know, convincing people and winning people over, whatever. The things that I just, I mean, my parents are cops and we don't have those skills. I mean, I just didn't learn them or whatever, however people get them. So, I mean, it's good to know, it's good to, to me, what I feel like I've managed is to find a world that I can be creative in. And I've brought myself close to people that I make films with, that I really love working with, and, um, and I feel really lucky to work with. Like, I have a really amazing crew, and they go off and do these things with me. I mean, sometimes you're, you know, you'll be on a, so I've had moments where I've been on a shoot and I'll, it's pouring down rain and it's three o'clock in the morning and it's freezing and I'll, you know, just for a second stop and be looking and going like, who are these people? Why do I get them? Why do I get this? Why, how could I be so lucky? You know, um, it's uh, like people give you really a part of their lives and you, and it adds to your life. The experience adds to me has been sort of the, like meant so much to me. So, um, I don't, you know, there's, I, whatever, I can o always bitch and moan, but really when it comes down to it, what I, gets me up in the morning is that I want to, like, get something going so we can all go away together again and, um, and try something. So I'm very attached to um, my little world as it is, and um, so, I don't know. Yeah. <coughs> it's all good, as the kids say. <laughs> I guess it's my turn. Could you talk a little bit about the, um, like if you see this as a shift in genre or the type of storytelling slightly, if you agree with that, um, what did you want out of this shift and what did you get? Um, they're all kind of genre films, really. I, don't, I mean, they're road movies, the westerns. They're all kind of, everything's a road movie, ultimately, I think. Um, but, I mean, what it really gives you is it gives you a sort of, this has more plot than anything I've done before. Like, talk about being in the editing room. I mean, this is the first time that the film could really be put together one way. Like, a lot of the other films, they could exist in different forms, but this, like, kept, the answers kept, appearing before me like you will not leave the you can't meander off and have your moment over here you have to stay the course like this is and and it was really fun to have that much of a road to follow and it also it just gives you I'm really I I like ambiguity and that's really what I want to make films about and but that can't just be a mess you know so it's nice if you, I think you have some kind of like real frame that you can work in and let things sort of, so you can sort of have the mist of the other things um, in a context that's like, you know, articulate. And, um, and so the, the sort of language of the film uh, has to be articulate and then it can be about things that are harder to put your finger on. I, in, in a dream world, like that would be the goal. So. Are you working on something now? Are you writing something? Are you traveling? Are you? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, who knows? Uh, yeah, I'm like you know, I'm trying to do stuff. I've got the dog, got the car going. Yeah. No. Um, anyway, thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Night Moves opens this Friday. Oh, yeah. I wanted to make sure to mention that. Yeah, how many people... Oh, don't put people on the spot. How many people will... Uh, They're all going. They're going. You're all going to go, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I just want to thank uh, Kelly for spending this hour with us. Oh. It's really meant a lot to us, to me, to everyone here, I assume, because I really enjoyed this conversation and listening to her talk. Thank you.